Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Yeah? First day, second day at Wanderlust? Awesome. So this is great to see all you guys here. My name is Sushma, and I'm going to be talking to you about my journey with self-healing um, with Ayurveda and Pranayam. So how many of you are familiar with the Ayurvedic principles? Yeah? Okay. We got a handful. And then how many of you incorporate pranayam or meditation as part of your sadhana? Sadhana means your daily ritual. Excellent. So there's a few of you here that are very familiar with all this. So I'm going to start off by sharing with you the sequence of events that led me down the path of, of yoga and Ayurveda. So I want to say it was about 12 or 13 years ago and I suffered a sports injury. It started out with just really, really sharp pain in the bottoms of both of my feet. And then one morning, I woke up, I took two steps out of the bed, and I snapped my plantar fascia on both feet at the exact same time. And that started a three and a half to four year struggle, which ended up taking away my willingness to survive, you know, wanting to be a part of this world. I was frustrated with the Western medical system because I had seen 23 different doctors and I had taken all sorts of x-rays and ultrasounds and CAT scans and steroid injections and nothing seemed to work. And over time, my inner well-being just started to collapse. So... Fast forward, you know, four years into it, I'm just fed up and I decide to take a leave of absence from the company and I ventured off to India in search of a cure. So I went to India and I started Ayurveda and I got about five or six days into the 10-day Panchakarma program. You guys all know what that, what that is. And I didn't quite make it. Um, for whatever reason, right, wrong, or indifferent, I just couldn't finish it. And I ended up meeting this individual who is now my guru. So he says to me, it was a Sunday afternoon, and just like a typical American, I walked in there with all of my files and all of my x-rays and all these reports from these 23 doctors that I had talked to, and I said, here, fix me. And he just calmly said to me, you know, just, just do yoga with me, and I promise you, you'll walk again in five days. So I had already been in a wheelchair at that point. I couldn't walk anymore. So I look at this guy and I'm like, right, you're going to cure me in five days. I've got all these amazing Western doctors in America and they couldn't fix me in three and a half years. How are you going to heal me in five days? But I went along with it, right? I had traveled across the world and so I decided to go with this. And so on Monday morning, he asks me to start doing yoga with him. And we do yoga from 6 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock. And then it's from 7 to 8, he has me do another batch of yoga with him. And then at 8 o'clock, he takes me with him as he's going to give one-on-one uh, -on -one yoga lessons. And he has me sit next to him, you know, not out in the audience, but his disciple right next to him. And we do more yoga. And it's not the yoga that you see in studios in California, right? This is the real deal. So... Very little asana, just focusing on an inward journey and focusing on your breath. So we do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday comes around, and we're in the middle of class, and my wheelchair is sitting in the corner of the room, and he says, I want you to stand up, and I want you to tell everybody how you feel. And I couldn't say it in my native language, and so I just said to him, I feel different and I never used the wheelchair ever again. So at that point, like, what just happened? Because I have been struggling for four years. I couldn't walk. You know, I would go to buy groceries at midnight so nobody could see me in the stores having to use those motorized carts. You know, I would crawl around the house. My kids would be looking at me, and they're two years old, and I'm like, why is mommy on the floor crawling, crawling around? Why couldn't she walk, right? So fast forward, here we are today. For the past 10 years, I have been doing pranayam every day, and I have 
adopted an Ayurvedic lifestyle. And that is what healed me in five days. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means and how I ditched the wheelchair and how these tools are available to all human beings, regardless of your religious background or how far you've come in yoga. And even if yoga is just about the physical asanas and getting your vinyasa sequence in, there's so much more to the eight limbs of yoga. And that's pranayam is one of them. And pranayam is actually two Sanskrit words, right? Prana is your life force. It is your vital energy. And yama is the mastery of that or regulation of that. So when you're able to balance and cleanse and regulate your prana, you actually have the ability to heal yourself from within. So underneath our bones and our muscles and all of our tissues is this energetic layer and that is where pranic energy lives, right? There's 72,000 nadis in our body. Nadis are like meridians. Those of you familiar with kundalini yoga, you know that they intersect at the seven chakras. And if you were to slice open a, a cadaver, you will not see these 72,000 meridians. They're not like your nerve endings, right? It's, it's very much at the subtle level of our being. And when you practice pranayam, you start to expand that space between your inhales and your exhales. And that's no different than the distance between one thought and another. And when you start to practice pranayam more rigidly and more with, with ease and with comfort and you start to tap into this energy inside of you, you start to expand that area between your two thoughts. And that's what yoga is. It's union of mind, body, and spirit. And when you're in that space and you connect with that vital energy, your true north, your master setting, your highest self, that calmness that you have when you're there on your mat practicing, it actually carries you throughout your life. And now it extends beyond the perimeter of your yoga mat and it starts to show all these wonderful side effects in your everyday life whether it's your relationships with your family, or it's how you behave in a corporate setting, or how you're able to heal yourself from physical wounds, or emotional wounds, or mental energy that's kind of stagnant. Because prana is intended to flow freely, right? And if that prana is blocked, or if it's maybe not flowing in the right direction, or it's obstructed, you're gonna start to experience things in your body. Your body's going to start to communicate with you. And you want to pick up on that when it's still whispering to you. You don't want to wait until it starts screaming at you like it did for me, right? Hindsight's always 20-20, but if I had known these tools of Ayurveda and Pranayam back then, maybe I wouldn't have been in a wheelchair for two years of my life, right? So the physiology of all of this is really simple. You guys remember back when we were in health class and in high school, the nervous system is actually made up of two components. There's the sympathetic side of our nervous system, and then there's the parasympathetic. In modern day, we spend a heck of a lot of time in the sympathetic side of our nervous system. Our breathing is really shallow. We're breathing from the tops of our lungs, our heart rate is extremely fast. We're sending a surge of hormones through our body, adrenaline and cortisol. We're in this always on mentality, right? We're go, go, go. But our parasympathetic side of the nervous system is lying dormant. And we're not going there and we're not retreating there enough to activate that side, which actually reverses the effect of stress on your body. It starts to calm all the turbulence that's going through our mind. It gives your thoughts an inner cleanse. And everything starts to flow in the right direction again. And so, how many of you are familiar with Nadi Shudan? It's called alternate nostril breathing. Okay? So, we're always doing um, Ujjayi Pranayama. Pranayam, sorry. Right? So, we're, we're very accustomed to doing that in our yoga sequences. But Nadi Shudan is meant to balance the three main nadis. So there's 72,000 of them, right? But Ida is on the left side of our body. Pingala is on the right side. And in the center is Sushumna. 
And sushumna has no attribute. It is that stillness. It's that calm. It's that place where you find your true north and you align with your highest self. Ida is known with, with the lunar, lunar qualities. It's very cooling. It's the feminine energy. The right side is associated with surya or the sun. It's heating. It's hot. It's masculine. It's red. And if these two are in conflict, you are never going to align to sushumna and you will never experience that optimum health or that bliss or samadhi that we all talk about in the eight limbs of yoga. So nadi shudan, alternate nostril breathing, it aims to balance, cleanse, and regulate our breath. And so these are not in conflict anymore. And when you start doing this on a regular basis, you can start for five minutes, you can do it for 10, you can do it for 20, it doesn't matter. But if you do this on a repeated basis, slowly you're going to start to see that now my worries are falling away. I'm starting to make choices that are better for me and for those that are around me that I come in contact with. My breathing starts to slow down. My heart rate comes down. My blood pressure is better. Everything is better. I'm sleeping better. And all of a sudden, life is just a lot more at ease. It's, it's effortless. And at the same time, you're able to cure yourselves of any kind of ailment that you might be struggling with in life. And that is what I practiced for those five days in India that helped me to rid this pain that had left me in this wheelchair. And at the same time, I started practicing the concepts of Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is yoga's sister science. It is a 5,000-year-old medicinal system, long before we invented surgery and everything that we are blessed with here in the West. This was the way we healed ourselves. And so in Ayurveda, there are these three energies, vata, pitta, and kapha. And in Ayurveda, we believe that everyone and everything has a qualitative nature to it. So your experiences, the foods you eat, the people that you come in contact with, how you choose to have your activity, how well you sleep, how well you digest, everything that's around you, because you are not just you in your flesh. You are so much more. It is all about the energy, and you're taking on the energy of everything that's around us. And Ayurveda teaches you to find that balance before it becomes a full-on disease that manifests itself in, into a physical symptom. So Ayurveda has six stages of disease, and it teaches you to become aware of any kind of imbalances that might be going on so you can take care of them before they turn into a physical symptom. So each one of us came into this world with our own blueprint. You have your own master setting, and that's different from hers, and it's different from mine. So your ratio of vata, pitta, and kapha is unique to yourself. And Ayurveda tells you that the more you distance yourself from your prakriti, your natural setting, the more unnatural life becomes. Now, it's okay to do that every now and then. You can go out and have those 15 to 20 beers the night before and then feel that the next day. It's okay if you do that every now and then. But if that pattern goes on unchecked, eventually some sort of disease will ensue. Might just be a bad headache, but if that depleting pattern goes on unchecked, life is going to become a little bit more unnatural. And Ayurveda's goal is to bring you back to your center, to bring you back to your specific ratio of vata, pitta, and kapha. Okay, so an example, um, if it's snowing out, and it's sub 20 degrees, and we go out there in the yoga attire that we have on right now, our body temperature is going to start to drop. But our body's natural tendency is to eventually get you back to 98.6 degrees, right? So we go back inside, we put on our gloves, we put on our scars, we put on our long johns, and now our body starts to come back to what is that normal thermostat for us. All the other thermostats in our body are going to obey that master setting. And so when we start to pick up on things that might not be serving us well, Ayurveda teaches you to become aware of them and make these quick tweaks throughout your day, right? So on a physiological level, 
our digestion and our lymphatic system is so critical to our overall well-being. And so in the beginning, you might say, well, okay, I can't have dairy anymore. Now I have this gluten intolerance or I can't have wheat. This is your body's way of communicating with you. It's still whispering. It's still telling you something's not right, right? Because pitta, that agni, that fire within all of us, its job is to digest. Its job is the minute you put any kind of food or experience in your body, its job is to digest it. So it wants to take in the nutrients from what you've just consumed, but it also wants to detoxify and get rid of things that are not serving you. Stale energy, stale patterns, and any kind of toxins that you might have accumulated by some of these decisions that we had made, those 15 bears I talked about, right? So... Ayurveda will teach you based on your doshas and where you are at that point in that day or that season or that point in your life on little tweaks that you can make to adjust that. So for example, it's, it's super hot outside right now, right? And if you have a pita dominant personality, it's not a good idea to have a hot cup of hot and sour soup. It's probably better for us to have a cold raw salad because that's going to bring your pita nature back down into check. But if you just take in more of what you already are, like increases like, your pita is going to be out of control and then the shadow side of pita starts to come out. So there are shadow sides and then there's the balance side of vata, pita, and kapha. And you want to try to work from your strengths so that you're able to connect with that inner spirit and that inner light inside all of us so that you're able to come out and live according to that consciousness. I think that we're all, humans are all put here on earth at the highest level to spread our consciousness. Each one of us has a unique gift. And if you're not able to tap in to what is natural for you or what is your highest nature, you're not able to give back. You're not able to serve. And you certainly can't do it if you're experiencing some kind of a physical symptom or mental anguish or, you know, thoughts that keep circulating through your mind and you're going through all this chatter and you just can't quite make sense of why are you here and why are you struggling. So that's a very quick overview. I'm not going to go into in-depth, you know, pita vata analysis for all of you, but I'm I'm certainly going to stick around for the next 20, 30 minutes to talk with you individually or also to answer some questions um, that you guys might have as a group, whether it's talking more about my experiences or general questions that you guys might have on Nadi Shudan or herbs and food choices, whatever it is, uh, this time is here for you guys. Go ahead. So can you speak a little bit more about what actually happened in India? Like just like what the food you were eating and like, you know, like other... Sure. So her question was, can you go into a little bit more detail about what transpired in those five days where I went from that wheelchair to being able to walk again? So uh, my guru had me do Nadi Shudan um, for a very long time. Each morning, I would say anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes of going on an inward journey. And there were moments where I was really struggling to, to calm down and find my center. But over time and over those three or four or five days, I was really able to connect with that inner energy that he was referring to. And when you practice Nadi Shudan, you're really trying to focus on your third eye, right? Your gaze is very soft, your tongue is soft, and you're breathing alternatively from your right and your nef left nostrils. And what we were doing was cleaning and balancing the Ida and the Pingala. And when you're breathing, you're breathing from the very bottom of your lungs. It's very deliberate, it's very intentional, and it's a very nourishing breath. You're excavating at the very bottom of your lungs. And so on a physiological level, he was improving my oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange because the alveoli, right, the, the air sockets that we, pack, the, that we pack into the bottom of our lungs, most of them exist on the bottom half of our lungs. They're not in the top half. And so when you get down in there, your blood is actually being oxygenated more efficiently and you're able at a molecular level to get rid of all those toxins. And in my case, they had been accumulating for 
four years. A lot of it was mental anguish. It was frustration. It was depression. It was anger, right? Because the rest of me is fine. Why can't I walk? And so a lot of that just sits at the bottom of your lungs. And now it permeates every time you breathe. It's going to your cells, your organs, your lungs. Everything is just, you know, being fed all of these toxins. And so when he, when he taught me to breathe from the very bottoms of our lungs, my, my belly is expanding. I'm filling in with prana, new life energy. And with each exhale, he's asking me to just get rid of whatever is not serving me. And I'd be doing this and tears would be flowing out of my eyes. And I couldn't quite understand, like, what is this voodoo stuff this guy is doing, right? I didn't know as much about yoga back then that I do now. And, and so that was a big component of it. We did do some asanas, but asanas are preparatory, right? They're there to help the prana start to loosen up and start to flow in the right direction. You're opening up blockages. And with each inhale and exhale, you're imagining these blockages just melting. And at the same time, um, according to my doshas, mine is vata, pita. Vata is more dominant for me than pita. So my diet consists of meals that are balancing for those doshas. I didn't want to aggravate it any further um, than it already had been, right, based off of the life experiences, because your, your doshas talk to you and they start to get further and further away from that master setting. And you can take herbs, you can make different choices, you can cook foods different ways with different herbs to help it start to settle your digestion and improve that exchange. And so now your lymphatic system is getting a, a cleanse. So think about it this way. When we want good cardio, we'll hop on a treadmill or we'll get on a bike and our heart's gonna get an amazing workout. And if you want to build muscle, you're going to start lifting weights. So your muscular system is getting what it needs. What do we do to cleanse our lymphatic system? You're supposed to breathe. And you're supposed to breathe very deep, nourishing breaths from the bottom of your lungs so that you're able to wring out. That's your, in essence, it's your spinal fluid. Right? It starts from the crown of your head and it goes to the base of your spine. And that cerebral fluid is flowing. It's prana. But if there's blockages and there's toxins in there, it's, it's feeding. It's communicating to your nervous system. It's communicating to the bottoms of your feet and your muscles and your cell. And something's not right. There's just exchange of, of junk. Because right? every day I'd be eating... But my cells are like, well, we're not quite getting the supply she just put in. And the garbage man hasn't come, and he's not taking these toxins out. So my cells are going rogue. They're doing whatever the hell they need to do to survive. And, and your body's telling you this when you have physical manifestations of all of that. And so my diet back then consisted of um, all these fresh, amazing vegetables that you only can get in India. They were there to calm down my pita because there was rage inside of me at that point. And so I was eating more cooling things, right? So every day my morning consisted of cucumber and mint water, coconut water, and there was absolutely no caffeine, no dairy, right? Because that stuff creates inflammation in our body. And we know that now with modern science, but Ayurveda was saying it 5,000 years ago. And so my diet consisted of tweaking a whole bunch of things that maybe weren't meant for me. And then he taught me. He taught me how to eat according to my doshas. And he taught me how to change them according to the season and according to the time of day, the weather, the company that I'm in, and what's going on with my life. If I'm having a really tough day at work, I know my breathing is shallow. I can already tell. And then I'm, I'm able to start picking up on some of these things. And so I'll just you know, throw a 15-minute private meeting on my calendar, don't tell my boss, that I'm going to go meditate because I know that the company is going to be better off if I'm a lot more stable. So I'll take 10, 15 minutes to do that, and that just kind of grounds me for the rest of my day. Go ahead. So his question was, how can I learn more, right? How can I find out what my prakriti is and what my doshas are and how I can eat according to that and, and make changes in my life to suit my lifestyle? There are lots of resources out there on the web. Mine will not be one of them. 
And the reason why is because I don't want to profit from it. The suffering that I had gone through, it was so deeply moving for me that I just had decided that there's no reason why other people should have to pay to learn the lessons that yoga had taught me. So the fifth yama in Patanjali's Eight Limbs of Yoga is called Aparigraha. And Aparigraha means only taking what you need and only taking what is enough and not having to you know, hoard or have possessiveness and, and attachment. So based on that yama, it just wouldn't be right for me to turn this into a business model. So there's a ton of stuff on the internet. Um, one of the people that I, one of the first books that I read was by Deepak Chopra. And his book is called The Perfect Health. There's a lot of information from Kripalu. There's a ton of up and coming millennials. How many of you are familiar with Sahara Rose? She's doing an amazing job of teaching Ayurveda to the younger generations. So I would tell you to, to search Ayurveda and take the test. I'm happy to speak with you independently after we're done here. I could look at your nails. I can check your, your tongue. I can talk to you. And I can tell you exactly what's going on. And I'll be there for you if you need that. I'm happy to give you my phone number, but I don't want a dime. All right. So there's like an actual test. It sounds like what you just offered him is a lot better. It, you know, to yeah. find out. But there's like there a, are. I just ask questions about your lifestyle. Yeah. So her question was, you know, there's, there's online tests, right? There's a lot of them. There are a dime a dozen. Right? Some are going to be a quick five questions, and then there's some algorithm that goes on on the back of that internet, and it's going to spit out your dosha for you. Those are available to you. I'll let you decide. Yeah? Uh, and then you can also meet with Ayurvedic practitioners and, and health coaches, and they will give you that in-depth analysis, and it is very good, right? But comes with it a financial commitment as well. But they're all very good. And there are tons of tools available for free online as well. Some go into more detail and they'll ask you lots of questions. But remember, when you're answering these questions, you really want to center yourself and, and answer these questions honestly. Because if you're able to be honest with yourself, you're going to be able to apply those learnings back. And we attract situations to us that reflect exactly how we show up in this world. And so it's very important that you honestly assess yourself and whatever it might be troubling you or whatever imbalances, it could be as simple as, you know, I've really got this, um, I wake up at two o'clock in the morning every night. I can't get a straight night of sleep. I do everything and I just can't do it. Folks, that's a vata imbalance. And I can tell you exactly how you can make some shifts in your life to help you. But you also need to have that private dialogue with yourself and assess those thoughts that are chattering through your mind and, and find out what your true north is. How are you going to align with your highest self? And when you're ready, that aspect of yoga and Ayurveda will be available to you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with making yoga a physical exercise. That is how I started out. And there's no shame in that. This will come to you when, when you're ready for it. And it will transform your life. And it'll help you trans, transcend suffering. Right? It could be something like this. But the woman that was there with me in India, that woman had cancer. And she brought her x-rays, just like all Americans. We are just so into all of our information. We've got everything, right? She's got her x-ray. She's got her CAT scan. She's, she's got all these doctor's notes. And she's like, you know, I have cancer. Here's my tumor. Six weeks later, no joke to you guys, her tumor was gone. It was gone. And I work with women right now who are struggling with breast cancer. And I teach them how to breathe. And it's helping them through remission. We can heal ourselves. You absolutely can, and I'm living proof of it. Next question before my makeup starts to run. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead. Can you give us an example? You said if somebody wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I'm one of those. Sure. So I just sure. want to hear what's the tip. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to lean on you for this one a little bit. All right. So vata dosha. Vata is, is moving. It's air. 
It's, it's ether, right? It's, we're in our head. We always have a lot of chatter going on. We, we bounce from one place to another. We are vibrant. We have a lot of energy. But we also sometimes lose sight of when that excitement turns into overwhelmness. Okay? And Vata people really need routine. They don't think they do because they're very spontaneous, but that's when they teeter on this edge of it getting to be a little too much, right? So routine really helps to balance vata. Waking up at the same time, eating at the same time, eating foods that will balance vata. So the things that you want to stay clear of, because vata is airy and it's dry, that's like popcorn and crackers. Not good for you, because like increases like. So if you're eating more of what you already are, and if your vata is imbalanced, you already have an accumulation. That vata has already been aggravated. You don't want to do more of that. You want to do the opposite of it. You want to do things that are going to ground you. I flew in from Detroit yesterday. Vata is my secondary dosha. And I'm in the air, right? I'm in the air for five and a half hours. And when I got here, I knew my vata was off. And so I did things to help ground me, stay in contact with the Mother Earth, meditate, pranayam. Nadi Shudan is an excellent pranayam to help ground vata. The foods that you eat, you want to choose things that are more warming. You want to include spices that are more warming. An excellent way to help you sleep at night is sesame oil. Sesame oil in your skin is the fastest way to balance vata. And if you warm up a little bit of sesame oil and put some essential oils in it, something like lavender that is going to be grounding and warming, and if you rub that on the soles of your feet every night before you go to bed, start from your heel and move out to your toe, and you're getting rid of any kind of stale energy and anything that's not serving you, and you're massaging the soles of your feet, you can even start from your knees down. My guess is that your body's going to soak that up pretty quickly. And that's going to help relax you. And it'll add, add that to your routine along with a glass of warm milk with some ghee and some turmeric. You can um, omit the turmeric and you can just put a little bit of cardamom and cinnamon, something that's warming, a warming spice. And then if you have that before bedtime, over time, you will find that you will be able to get past that 2 o'clock mark because guess what? That's the time of vata. So there are times of the day when vata is predominant and pitta is dominant, right? 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock is when pitta, high sun, agni, surya, heat, energy, right? And that's why in Ayurveda, they tell you to have your biggest meal at lunchtime. We can't do that always in America, but you do the best that you can. But when the sun is at the highest point, pitta is at the highest point in your body. And so its job is to digest. But later on at night, you've moved on from the pitta time of the day, and now you're getting into to kapha and to vata, and the whole cycle repeats itself throughout the day and throughout the seasons. So Ayurveda teaches you to live in harmony and to align with that wave and don't go against the wave. You don't want to create more friction in life. You want to kind of ride that wave and do what's natural, and get back to that natural setting, and not deviate too much from it. We can talk more afterwards. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk.